I was also thinking as I was editing our first app that um, uh, something we could do as an like icebreaker or or like help with small talk in the beginning is we could talk about recent pop culture news. However, we are we're going to be record releasing these like while after, so it's like we could talk about pop culture news. It could we'll... be like an icebreaker for ourselves. Okay, that's true. Um, currently, I have, uh, I have running up, wait, running up a hill, deal with God. Running up that hill. <laughs> running up that hill. I have that song stuck in my head, which I love Kate Bush. I love that song. My mom's played her. Um, I've had I... that song stuck in my head for a while as well, ever since the clips ever have since been around <laughs> well it's insane it's like been top song worldwide for like five weeks in a row or something maybe not that long but um and the thing that i am irrationally petty about is the fact that i had literally just added it as like the first song to this one character playlist being like no one ever thinks of this song this is such a great song and i had added it to this character playlist now everyone is thinking of that literally song. it was like a week later i was like no i was being original when i did that so what are my recent pop culture um i was just listening to the new episode of the like a virgin podcast which had like a much looser conversation because it's usually like a scene but this one was more like a full conversation about different things but a lot of it was about like gay serial killers <laughs> oh and yeah and they were like John Wayne Gacy was really funny actually because he was like I didn't I don't do clowning to like get victims I do it because it's fun <laughs> yeah and they were they were also like how come there isn't like a John Wayne Gacy biopic and then like 15 minutes later they were like there should be a John Wayne Gacy biopic musical and I was like I would do that you would that's literally exactly your kind of like bananas cup of tea oh god that just gave me the mental image of banana tea and i don't want to think about that um okay <laughs> should we start yeah hello and welcome to it's given camp i'm saffron and i'm fabiola what are we talking about today fabiola we're doing our first piece of media for the podcast, and it's written on the wind, directed by Douglas Sirk from the year 1956. You picked this out. <laughs> yes, I pick, I pick out most of the things that we're going to cover because I'm the one with the list, but you also have to be like, I agree that I will watch this. <laughs> Uh, yes. To be fair, I've not said no yet. Um, should we, how how do we want to, do we want to like give a plot yeah. summary? Are we yeah, just going to be like. I was going to ask if we, if we want to do like a, a plot summary first. Well, can I just say, I think the Wikipedia plot summary is like terrible. I haven't seen it. <laughs> okay. If you look up written on the wind, um, what it says is. Mitch Wayne is a geologist working for the Hadleys, an oil-rich Texas family. While the patriarch, Jared, works hard to establish the family business, his irresponsible son, Kyle, is an alcoholic playboy, and his daughter, Mary Lee, is the town tramp. Mitch harbors a secret love for Kyle's unsatisfied wife, Lucy, a fact that leaves him exposed when the jealous Mary Lee accuses him of murder. That's like the last six minutes. Yeah. <laughs> the... Uh, the the accusation of murder is literally the last thing that happens in this movie. So, like, it, it's a terrible plot description because, like, it, I wouldn't say that Mitch is the main character. First of all, he's the least entertaining character. Okay, I think he's <laughs> fine. Like, there's a lot about him to talk about in terms of, like, the casting of Rock Hudson. Yeah. But like, like 
in terms of like the text itself the rest of the characters give a bit more to talk about we first watched this film for class which means i have my original notes that i took the first time i saw this and my favorite quote in it is because i write sometimes i just write these class notes like live tweets and so one of the the bullet points is oh hello who is this lady carving a knife into the table mary lee is probably fabiola's favorite you are correct <laughs> That was before we had ever discussed the film. (laughs) I also wrote down one of her quotes, which is my favorite quote of the movie, but I don't think I should say it now. I should say it later. (laughs) Basically, the plot is there's a rich guy. There's a, there's a, she's a secretary, basically, Lucy and- Lucy, played by Lauren Bacall. She, uh, I feel like she has the, 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 strongest transatlantic accent of the cast yeah it's like pretty distinct especially compared to like her contemporaries so we there's this secretary and this uh guy mitch walks in and is like oh you're new say let's go um let me go show you to my friend the 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 son of the company you know the owner of the company that you work for and an oil company yes and it's like the hadley oil company because hadley's the family last name yeah turns out you know he's this eccentric rich playboy and she doesn't seem to be that interested in him and he's like no let me prove prove to you i'm a different person in the air and they go for a flight if anything, I'd say the story is the story of, like, their relationship falling apart. Yeah. Because then they get married, and then she finally um, comes home with him, and then they're trying to have a baby, and it turns out uh, he has a weakness, in quotes, Um and so then he starts drinking again and because he she had kind of changed him and then he starts to deteriorate again and and um he basically then like the last like 20 minutes is this whole scene where she ends up lucy reveals that she's pregnant after all and and kyle has got these you know these thoughts in his head from mary lee that she's been actually sleeping with mitch and so he like slaps her and throws her around mary lee is his kyle's sister kyle goes storming out of the house and mitch is like you better not come ever back here and then when he does come back there's a there's a tussle between him and mary lee and mitch and kyle ends up getting shot and killed so that's what then the last six minutes are of because mary lee this whole time has been in love with mitch and um, I, I was saying that I'm pretty sure Kyle's the one who accidentally shot and killed himself. Oh, see, I always read it that Mary Lee was the one who did it. I don't know that. I feel like that scene is like deliberately shot to be confusing, but like even yeah. with it being confusing, like it's pretty clear that Mitch didn't do it. Oh, Mitch didn't do it. And it was yeah. an accident. Like no matter yeah. what, it was an accident. Okay, here's my question. Why do you pick this to di- this film in terms of camp? And why why do you want to discuss it in in the context of camp? Because like it's like the Douglas Sirk movie that I find most entertaining and he's like pretty known for like putting on this kind of like at first glance they're like pretty standard 1950s movies but like when you actually sit down and watch them they're actually kind of subversive for their time and have a lot to say that like comments on the 50s while also very much looking like the 50s yeah i mean aesthetically it is extravagant it also has like the brightest colors of his movies that I've seen so far. It's not 
garish, but I mean the fashion, the gowns, the the bright pink hotel hallway, the um, <sighs> what do you, I we're gonna have to talk about the scene eventually, the scene where uh the stairs, the stairs, <laughs> uh, but yeah, she's wearing like something like bright pink and frilly, and that's too right. Yeah, she changes from like this kind of shiny satin pearly dress into like this pink frilly nightgown. And um, for people who have not seen this movie, how would you describe what this scene is? Okay, so so we're we're now immediately talking about the stairs. <laughs> Look, we have to. I remember that was like the scene that stuck in my mind the most after watching it the first time. It's it's the best scene of the movie and arguably the most camp scene of the movie. But like basically for setup of the scene, um Mary Lou like a, a lot of like her defining characteristics is that like she sleeps around and yet she's like really enamored with Mitch and so like prior to this scene like the cops bust her at a motel and then they bring her back to their mansion and like then like her date is like telling like her dad and Mitch that like oh like this is just like what she does like ask anyone on main street that like that really like stresses out her dad and like while that's happening she like goes up the stairs into her room and like blasts this really fun music and she's dancing and she's also like dancing with a picture of mitch as well and like so her dad is like not only like already upset with her but like now she's just like loud music so he walks all the way up the like grand and he manages to go all the way to the top but something something happens like either the stress or whatever that he just kind of like loses his grip or balance at the very top and just falls all the way down while the music is still blaring. And then like Lucy and Mitch are like shocked at the death. He's fully dead. Yes. You see like a close up of his face and like the veins are bulging and the music's just like blasting yeah. while she's dancing around. <laughs> The juxtaposition and like the amount of things going on in that scene very camp it really is like it feels absurd but also on second viewing it felt so right i think the first time i saw it i was like it kind of felt out of place but knowing i guess what kind of film it was going uh, watching it this the second time it all of the melodrama feels earned i feel like it not only feels earned but it it feels like it's all very much done on purpose like douglas sirk clearly knows what he's doing and i'm from like some of my research uh film school rejects article like brought brings up brecht because douglas sirk like started his career in like German film and theater. And so the article explains that Brecht believed actors should call attention to the theatricality of their performances so that the audience would be emotionally removed and more likely to be critical of what they are seeing. And so like, not only does this movie do that with the performances because the actors are very much, like not only are like, the actors emoting a lot in like a Brechtian way, but also like the sets and the are, are also doing a whole lot as well. Mm. 
what who's the actress who plays um mary lee dorothy malone yeah i feel like she is probably the most expressive of them all yeah and like this this leads me to like one of the scenes that i wanted to talk about which is when she's like by the the pond that i is, was like, thinking that was really the exact idyllic scene. looking she's like at this like really beautiful like retro idyllic pond and she's like in this like really pretty like um plaid like shirt and jeans and like her perfect blonde hair and she's like reminiscing about a childhood memory with her and Kyle and Mitch but the memory is all in voiceover of like child actors it's a long scene but it's basically her a memory of like her even like back in childhood she was like telling Mitch that like they were gonna get married and so and so but as the as as you hear these kids act and deliver their lines um Mary Lee is like emoting for them like she's like very much acting to people who aren't there it's kind of funny yeah like she might as well be mouthing the little girl's lines am i beautiful Uh uh-huh do you love me sure you're my girl when we grow up you'll marry me won't you mitch i love you so much Okay, I don't know if now's the right time to ask you this, but I I am curious. If relating to the acting, all of the acting, it the word that comes to my mind is melodramatic. And as we're still in the early episodes of this pod in this conversation, um, is melodramatic and camp like are those synonyms? No. So is the scene at the pond or other acting choices are they both camp and melodramatic at the same time or yeah it's not just emotive acting what makes it camp it's the emotive acting plus the rest of the factors and the scenes such as the really idyllic perfect pond and her cute outfit because like one of our favorite shows battlestar galactica the 2000s one it's very melodramatic but it's like it's also in a really gritty and grounded setting i see do you do things then need to be visual to be camp i would say at least most things are because a lot of camp is formed by layers of meaning and the layers of audio and visual elements very much help contribute to that formation you are genuinely like i am learning so much from this (laughs) so what are some of the layers then in written on the wind i feel like one of the things with most layers in this movie like even though Mary Lou is Mary Lee's my favorite character she isn't like as full of things to dissect as Kyle Mm. because like not only is does he spend most of this movie having a breakdown he's also he's having a breakdown because he's like questioning his masculinity yeah because that starts when um he's asking the um his and his his wife lucy's doctor like can lucy have a baby and he's like yeah she can but let me find direct quote um that the 
that the test showed a weakness in his yeah. fertility and like weakness is such a loaded term in relation to men and masculinity yeah well and it's already been established that he has he struggles with masculinity we know from the the kind of the first like real conversation he has with lucy in the plane where he talks about how his father always wanted him to you know grow up and be like him but also grow up and be like mitch and he never felt like he could meet those expectations that he was instead like his uncle who he, he was instead like his uncle who died at 30. I guess I don't see in some ways is that I don't maybe this is because I'm just not versed in like the fashion of the 50s but I don't really see like a physical like uh physical aesthetic like uh depictions of his the layers of his masculinity and the and his uh subsequent breakdown i mean like his character like also relates a lot to and is contrasted with mitch and he's played by rock hudson who was like one of the uh, like beauty standards for men in the 50s mm. so just compare him with rock hudson and like whatever it is that he would lack is probably what differentiates him from like um fashion and masculinity in the 50s does the car mean anything i don't know i just i just I just really liked that it was like this bright yellow. I think like Mary Lee it's calls it- It's a tiny it, bright yellow car. Yeah, and like she calls it like like the, like the mini car or something. Like she calls it something funny. Like Mary, Mary Lee's car is larger. And it's also this bright red with like this aqua colored wheel. Yeah. Or like- the steering wheel and it's it's um it has a a like engraving with her initials on it yes when i was first watching the film the very first time i did not like kyle i thought he was a creep um but this time i felt really sad for him it's a tragedy yeah but like it's it's the thing about camp it's that kyle's an entertaining tragedy it is true. That is true. Because he's just like, by the end of the movie, he's basically destroying the house. Like he's breaking plates and knocking down entire bookshelves. Yeah. And in all of his, his, everything he says is big. Like there's not any subtlety to his lines. He's like, does an entire monologue talking in his sleep. I forgot about that. I literally just it is an entire it's an entire expository monologue which he does while he is sleeping. Yeah, which it is a little bit like insane that they're like, okay, so we're gonna have this scene later when Mitch and Kyle are gonna talk about how like Mitch is gonna be like, you always, you know, the blame always got put on me. But the the way that they signed to set that up is to get the expository is sleep talking. Like it could have been like Mary Lee could have easily been like the way that that exposition got given, right? I feel like we wouldn't be talking about it if it wasn't done as he was asleep. True, true. It is more fun that way. Don't touch me. Don't touch me or tell my father what I'll do. My father. We weren't stealing, were we, Mitch? We were just stacking some bottles up for you. 
So we were doing was Mitch, Mitch, Mitch. Wait for me, wait for me. But like, yeah, everything about Kyle's breakdown it has to do with questions of masculinity, which is pretty camp. Like, not only is he like, does he think he's infertile, but he also then begins to suspect that Lucy's having an affair with Mitch, who is like a much more like traditionally masculine person than him. It is interesting to me that, like, the betrayal is, he feels it, like, he seems to be equally upset at both of them. Because cause that's another thing, too, is, like, Mitch is my best friend. He, he, he did this horrible thing to me. But Lucy's also his wife. Yeah. I know. But, like, their, Mitch and Kyle's friendship is... That, that does, it, it, I think that to me is like one of the more interesting things. I'm honestly more interested in like their dynamic than Kyle and Lucy's dynamic or Lucy and Mitch's dynamic. Where the fact that like they were schoolboys together, like they go everywhere together. Like Mitch seems to kind of know Kyle's every move. Not to like cut you off but I was I was wondering if you like a saw any queer coding between the two and b if you could see like the subtext of um Rock Hudson being this like guy who has to who has like this codependence of being a sort of parent to this dysfunctional family. Oh, I was fully working up to asking you the question, do you think um, Mitch Conlon and uh, Kyle Hadley have explored each other's bodies? <laughs> yes, I definitely think there's there's a there's a queer subtext there. It, it you know, especially the fact that I mean Mitch as a character obviously I think it is um, it is impacted by the the real like historical knowledge of knowing Rock Hudson's sexuality, um, and like the industry did know as well, and like Douglas Dirk obviously knew, like mostly because of like they were frequent collaborators. Like he was Rock Hudson was often like the leading man in Douglas's movies. Yeah. Like, even though the Rock Hudson is, like, this, you know, sp this icon and this, you know, beauty, you know, beauty, beauty, mas standard of masculinity, he, in the two films that I've seen him in, Written on the Wind and All That Heaven Allows, he still, he plays kind of, like, a bit of, like, the unconventional man. Yeah, because he's, like, in both of those in those of these films, he's like very like rugged and down to earth, but also really kind and gentlemanly. Gentlemanly, and also hasn't been with any other woman before. You know, like there's that comment that the 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 patriarch. You know, I can, is his name Joe or something? Something very generic and American. Um he makes some comment to Mitch being like, well, when are you going to get married? And he's like, ah, I was never good at finding one. And the exception, of course, is Lucy. He's in love with Lucy. But I don't know. I mean, he shared his whole, his life partner up to that moment had been Kyle. Yeah. And also like, not to, not to like ignore my second question, but like Mary Lee does seem like pretty, maybe like jealous of Kyle in the sense that Mitch pays more attention to him than he does to her. Yeah, yeah, oh, for sure. 
I mean, Mary Lee kind of has the vibes that she's a little bit jealous of everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, they, you know, she, she's like, Kyle, you, you, you took Mitch away from me, but also, I don't know that, yeah, like they, Mitch and Kyle definitely have this like codependent relationship for sure. And um you while kyle is having his breakdown like mitch has gotten to his like breaking point where he's like i can't i can't deal with this anymore i just need to leave i don't know i think it is it's really interesting i also just think like the like the two scenes that mitch has with his dad are also really interesting where his his dad's also this like really down to earth um you know kind of like of you know kind of the regular american guy but they have they also like seem to have like a such a like supportive relationship in comparison at least to the hadley's family dynamics <laughs> yeah like even though um kyle and mary lee's dad is like a big looming presence he's also barely there he's more of a of a metaphor and idea than an actual character yeah especially if we're gonna talk about the final shot but like i i want to go back to like my second yes. question what was your second question again is like i like it's not that much of like a question but just a thought that i had regarding um the subtext of like rock hudson being gay while also being cast as like this role of like being the responsible character in th this movie and like in particular like being responsible for the antics of these people in his life and so I just like immediately thought of of like respectability politics and like gay mm. people being like an example for the rest of the world yeah, I mean, he has to be the straight man, not literally straight, I mean, kind of literally straight, but just like, he is the most kind of, um, like, rule follower. He, he even, he even like, Lucy is kind of, uh, even though she's presented first as like this, you know, she's top of her job, you know, do this great secretary, she still gets to run away with, with uh, Kyle. And yeah, like that is, it is def that is definitely, a, I hadn't thought of that. Um, I, I found the most camp thing about Lucy besides like her really dramatically falling after Kyle hits her. Um, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> Um, but like her identification with the Hadleys, even though like she knows that they're really dysfunctional, like when Mitch says to hell with the Hadleys, she replies, I'm a Hadley. Yeah, it is a little, it is a little, I guess, sad or not but not surprising that we don't really get to see any of her home life we don't get to see where she's come from but yeah i mean once i guess the hadleys are supposed to be her new family and she, i mean she does seem to 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 love the the dad a lot um but she never gets along with mary lee but like she she still finds excitement in the Hadley antics. Yeah. Like she very much went along with like the trip at the beginning. And mm -hmm. like she agreed to marry Kyle after they'd like barely known each other. Well, so we're like talking respectability politics and remainders of the Hayes Code, they only are in bed together. You only see them in bed together after they got married. Yeah. But like, yeah, Lucy, she very much is trying to straddle the line between like the craziness of the Hadleys and 
Mitch's relative normalcy. And in the end, she chooses the normalcy. She chooses Mitch. Speaking of the end, what should be the last shot of the movie, because for months I've been thinking that the shot of Mary Lee was the last shot of the movie and it should Same. be the last shot of the movie. But it's the fucking like, gate just, closing, I yeah, guess. <laughs> yeah. Girls going back in time be like, Douglas Sirk, you have to make sure the last shot is the one of Mary Lee at like her dad's desk with the big portrait of her dad like staring down at her as like she holds the very phallic oil oil rig. Oh, I wouldn't say hold. And I she would looks say really depressed and wearing an ugly suit. Yeah. Yeah, she's I... fully stroking it. She's caressing it. <laughs> Can we spend like an entire podcast just breaking down the layers of that image? Like that image is one of the most camp things in this movie. Because of all the layers in it. <laughs> There's just yeah. a lot going on. Like the way that if we're talking about, I mean, on the conversation about fashion, where she was always, you know, in the bright colors and and the dresses. She's in like full, like monochromatic bright pink outfits and just like wearing like the height of 1950s bombshell fashions. And then at the end, she's in a boring gray suit and like rigid, tight business professional. Because she doesn't want to be like a business professional and inherit the family's wealth. She she wants to both fool around with men and be with Mitch. And at the end, she has neither of those things. Yeah. The one thing she has is the little oil rig model. <laughs> well, and it's like, it's, it. I feel like it can be so, that like her holding that can be so many things at once. Like it can be her like as like that a metaphor of like her own, you know, like it, she's underneath her father's image. Like she's getting, she's taking on his power. Like she, she now has the penis. And also like back, back to the staircase scene like she might have indirectly killed her father but she she hasn't gotten rid of him in any way yeah but and then at the same time she also is like caressing it in this way that is very sensual and so she also hasn't lost her desires to be with men and to be sexual and be horny yeah which is like for the 50s that's like a really subversive message in the sense that Cirque is like isn't it sad that she can't be a slut anymore yeah on the surface you might watch this film and be like oh god he's really like why is he putting this woman down but then it's like no that's the point the point is that she's been like forced into this position at the end and it is a tragedy like you have to to in the 50s you have to make you have to tell that story to to have that message am i making sense i guess <laughs> yeah yeah um one of the things that i took note of from the aforementioned article is that they mentioned the critics jean-louis camoli and jean narboni in which they like categorized films in different ways and and um written on the wind can be seen as like a category e film which category e films seem at first sight to be firmly within the dominant ideology and under its sway but on the second glass are are ambiguous and critical towards dominant modes of representation I know this is going a bit back to, uh, you know, a, a scene we already discussed. So, so, you know, if I'm taking us off the point, that feel free. 
But am, do I remember correctly that there was some story, was it, it was about two celebrities dating and I think maybe it was, was it Kanye and, and Julia Fox where it was like, yes, yes, where it um, literally there was, was this tweet that was like, this is the beginning of written on the wind yeah because their first date was like kanye like taking her on an entire trip and giving her like this entire wardrobe and that's exactly what kyle does at the beginning of this movie which is take her on a trip and then at the hotel he shows her like this big walk-in closet walk-in closet dr- like the um dresser all the drawers are filled it's like the counter is covered in makeup and like beauty products a bunch of bouquets and like the living room area a bouquet of roses in the shape of a heart there's like a bunch of bouquets in that scene yeah there's champagne decadence (laughs) yes camp (laughs) same can be said about the stairs slash Mary Lee dancing scene. Yeah. <laughs> There's this Cirque quote that I think is really like meaningful, which is there is a very sh- short distance between high art and trash and trash that contains an element of craziness is by this very quality near to art. Ooh. That is a good quote. <laughs> Bars. Bars. <laughs> and I I also feel like that quote kind of relates to um, how a lot of feminist critics then reevaluated a bunch of like older melodramas, which like this is part of like the melodrama slash women's picture films, which were often like seen as like really basic and the weepies yes as like oh they're just here to make you cry and they're just here so you can like see people be emotional but but like they're also a lot about um focusing on like the female experience of those eras and and like there's there's just a lot you can explore within yeah like, older melodramas that really relate to camp and how they were maligned but there's also they were seen as not having all that much substance and they were maligned for that but camp is about searching for the substance and superficiality. Hmm. Yeah. Because most of the time, if a director puts it in, they're putting it in on purpose. They're putting it in for a reason. But even if they didn't put it in for a reason, what you take away from it can still be meaningful and significant. Yeah like this movie like not just because we watched it for one of alex's class um one of our professors alexander keller yes <laughs> shout out to alexander keller um one of the things she says a lot and that i like really keep to heart is that it, it's basically to paraphrase is that like you're not crazy for thinking that you like saw something in the film that like you you thought is worth pointing out like um like subtextually or that like basically like if you saw something intellectually in there it was already there to begin with and it just needed you to point it out mhm if you see it in the text, it's in the text. Is that was that the short yeah. phrase? Yeah. Like regardless of like how out there you think your thought is, if you are having that thought in the first place, it means that 
there was something already there to provoke that thought. Exactly. Uh, hey, you said at the start that you had a, a, a favorite Mary Lee quote. Oh, yes. It's, it's, oh, it's when she says, I'm filthy, period. <laughs> Yep, that is um that is a Fabiola quote, <laughs> or a quote that you would like. <laughs> she she's proud of it. That is something that is yeah. so so fun about her character is that she is unabashed in her own sexuality, which especially within like the nineteen fifties um, production code context is incredibly camp and subversive yeah and by the end the average 1950s audience sympathizes with her yeah do you have anything else to say about this movie um i think what i want to say is written on the wind might actually be one of my favorite films it's one of my favorite films that's pre-1990 <laughs> i know it's my favorite cirque film of the ones that i've seen of his and it's one of my favorite movies from the 50s like that yeah. i will confidently say and the shot of mary mary lee at the end is one of my favorite shots of all time it is it is a really good shot What's really special and challenging about this movie, especially is like the first text that we tackle for this podcast is that it's from the 50s. So this is this film it has about as much as you could show in an American film in the 50s, mm -hmm. which just you, it kind of forces you to find the camp in a lot of scenes. Like a lot of the times it's already there, but in other times in the movie, you, you have to look for it. I, I guess that it might mean that, that it's, a, it's a, not as approachable of a text if you were coming about it from like an academic perspective. But I still think it's fun, no matter what, like, your knowledge um, is. Yeah, you're going to have fun with this movie since it's basically, like, rich people absolutely losing it. Yeah, and it's not And that's always long. entertaining. <laughs> like, it's an hour 40, I it's think. It's an hour and a half. Yeah. And it's bright and there's pretty colors. Yeah, it's, it's, as much as we're, like, very much intellectually analyzing this film within the lens of camp, it's also a, a look at the pretty colors, look at these people acting oh, movie. <laughs> um, it's the most on-the-nose, like, title card ever where it's written on the wind is the title, the, the image is the door open with like the wind blowing some leaves and a song is playing about how it's written on the wind. <laughs> the song is called Written on the Wind. Yeah. Um, go watch it. If you haven't seen it, we recommend it. Um, if you're filthy, be proud of it. You can find us on Twitter at GivingCampPod and under the hashtag It's Giving Camp Pod. On Instagram at It's Giving Camp Pod. All lowercase, one word. And on Patreon. This podcast is produced by Fabiola Liano at Fabiola underscore Liano and edited by Saffron Heftigalb at Galb Hefta. Our theme music is by Harrison Murray. Yeah, bye. I don't know. I don't know what how to do a sign off.